Welcome to a special session of the Avalog Lecture Forum. On this session, brought to you by the Avalog Initiative, we're focusing on a significant anniversary in this year, 2022. This is the 75th anniversary of the Truman Doctrine, a doctrine that came out of one country, changed its position on the world stage, and changed the international order thereafter. To talk about this and go deeper into this area, we have invited international scholar, Dr. Patrick Mendes, a distinguished visiting professor of transatlantic relations at the University of Warsaw in Poland. He is a former American commissioner of the US National Commission for UNESCO at the Department of State and a military professor in NATO, as well as the Indo-Pacific commands of the Department of Defense. Previously, Professor Mendes served as a Taiwan fellow of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taipei and a distinguished visiting professor of Sino-American relations at the Yenqing Academy of Peking University in China. He has lectured at the Leningrad State University, Moscow State University of the former Soviet Union. And Professor Mendes has traveled to and worked in more than 130 countries over a very illustrious career. We're indeed honored to have him. He's also listed on Who's Who in the World and he's a fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. Born right here in Sri Lanka, he's an American diplomat and alumnus of the Harvard University, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura. Professor Mendes, we're indeed honored to have you with us and would like to invite you to share your thoughts to investigate the whole point of President Biden's new Truman Doctrine in Ukraine. And if you were to ask the question, what's past is prologue? Thank you very much, George, uh, for inviting me. It is a very great honor to participate in your very important uh, uh, series of interviews that you have conducted in the past. And you also have a very illustrious career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sri Lanka and later on in the Bandar Naika Center, where I had the privilege to give series of lectures in the past. So thank you for inviting me again. So uh, as you asked me, I prepared a few notes uh, over here to talk about uh, Truman Doctrine, um, uh, where, how it came about and how it is evolving. And you, we try to understand whether this uh, Truman Doctrine has any relevance to the current uh, events uh, in world affairs, especially related to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I am speaking from the University of Warsaw in Poland and a uh, uh, great privilege to participate in your uh, 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 series of lectures, um, uh, George. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So uh, on March uh, 12th, 1947, Harry S. Truman, our president after Franklin D. Roosevelt passed away after World War II, uh, Harry S. Truman, President gave a joint lecture to the US Congress on this date, March 12, 1947. There he said very important uh, speech that formulated into what the Truman Doctrine is, uh, 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 is considered to be his foreign policy. That it seems to me has been continuing until the uh, Cold War ended and even today. So in his lecture, in his speech to the US Congress, he said, every nation must choose between alternative way of life. He pointed out two major issues or major points. He said the, the world of majority of people and the guarantees of the individual liberty. This is the one point. So America, all the majority of the world's people must guarantee the individual liberty. And the second part he said was, uh, the power relies on the terror and oppression, which means uh, control in the media, newspapers and radio at that time, and fixing elections. That means, uh, for example, extending the uh, the tenure of the leaders or change in the constitution to their personal advantage and so forth. And also the uh, repression of personal freedom of people is the problem of these uh, oppressive regimes. So you have uh, two choices. One is to have individual liberty 
or you wanted to live on a suppression of the personal freedoms. So therefore, US said, US policy should be on to support the free people, free people who resist the suppression. That comes to me at that time is the, like uh, people like uh, uh, leaders like uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi or later Nelson Mandela. And those are the people that uh, America need to support because they are fighting against the suppression of the personal freedoms for their own countries. So that became a America's foreign policy is the one of those two foreign, uh, uh, points I mentioned. So America decided to go through the liberty, individual liberty of the world and uh, people, not the regimes that suppress uh, those regime, uh, uh, people. So later on, this policy, more or less in a subtle policy of the US government, throughout the post-World post War period, during the Cold War. So there, this became a more activated pretty much uh, when uh, there are certain countries trying to create uh, and make uh, enlarge their territorial integrity and put the pressure on other countries. Like for example, in the South China Sea, when the Chinese government was building these artificial islands, at the protest from the uh, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, and Malaysia, and uh, Brunei, and those countries, they built these uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea. At that time, President Xi Jinping promised uh, Barack Obama when he visited Washington. And President Xi said, we are not going to, to turn this island into military bases or not to militarize at all. But while he was saying that one, he was actually doing in South China Sea. So this kind of uh, suppression and uh, uh, infringements on the free people of the region create some kind of problem for the US because not only uh, it not tell the honestly what they are doing, but at least they are opposing uh, uh, the US uh, 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 acknowledgement and uh, re re revelation of these uh, islands are being built there. So therefore, that is the one part of the, in the Obama administration, and Obama administration was lied uh, by the President uh, Xi Jinping when he said there is no militarization of this island. Now we know it is not the truth. And we knew at that time, uh, US knew that was the case. But uh, that is, uh, interference in the other countries in the region, no matter what the historical legacies and historical reasons are, it is still disputed. Okay, as you know, Philippines went to the International Court of Justice and tried to got the, their own resolution. These are illegally built in this. Now this become a major point uh, to uh, US to stand up to this uh, Truman Doctrine, these policies. And then uh, more importantly, during the uh, President Donald Trump's time, and there was uh, uh, interfering of the US election by the Russian intermediaries and Russian uh, hackers even getting into the, our election system and interfering. That really hard home uh, on that issue. Now you have uh, this uh, Russian interfering with the US election uh, and it created uh, it's, a, it's just like it's a really direct attack on the American democracy. So those two events was, were, uh, were in the mind of uh, American policymakers. And then uh, when uh, President Donald Trump became elect, uh, elected as the, our president and his uh, opponent, uh, Hillary Clinton and his running mate, uh, uh, Virginia Senator, Tim Kaine, uh, where uh, he was my senator, matter of fact. And uh, during this, their campaign, uh, they tried to advocate that uh, challenges that you are facing from both China and Russia. Then when he, they lost the election and Senator uh, Tim Kaine returned to his uh, previous job as the US Senator in the Senate, 
and he was also the leading member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Then he authored the article in a Foreign Affairs Journal in 2017. He said uh, that uh, new, doc new Truman Doctrine should be the America's foreign policy. That was, he said, is a year after uh, President uh, Donald Trump was elected. In his uh, article, in Foreign Affairs article, I read it again and uh, tried to understand what is the key points. And he said, uh, US must support the non-state actors. That means uh, like Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi and other freedom writers, freedom writers around the world who are fighting for their freedom. And that means it's uh, similar to the Truman Doctrine, he's going after to support in the freedom uh, of those people around the world. And the second point is very important equally, which is he said, uh, responsibil responsibility to protect. That means R2P, responsibility to protect. That means the US should intervene in uh, some kind of domestic affairs and genocide going on in some countries, US has the obligation to join and stop that kind of genocide by the regimes. Just like, for example, what is happening in current in Eritrea uh, and also in, uh, in Myanmar, for example, and even in the Sudan. So the responsibility to protect is the America's responsibility. So therefore, pretty much is the new Truman Doctrine in his article, he argued this must be the US foreign policy. It's the renewal of the Truman Doctrine. So this idea came to be much of the result of what happened in the US in the Obama administration and also now continuing in the after continuing into the four years of a Trump administration, uh, President Trump's administration. So one is focused on China, another one is also Russia. So now here we have this uh, President Joe Biden in his inaugural address uh, last year. And he said, uh, we lead not by the example of power, but by the power of the example. So that means uh, America first need to find its democratic values that it was kind of destroyed during the uh, Trump administration. In Trump administration, he uh, disregard the democratic values and he is more aligned with the autocrats uh, uh, like North Korean leader and uh, Turkish uh, and others. And also he undermined the, the uh, US alliances uh, uh, around the world, like in Japan and South Korea and he undermined not only that uh, in the Western Europe, uh, NATO, NATO uh, alliances. He undermined, he, need, he said, America first, first, we don't need to, to have these alliances. So that uh, undermining is kind of causation for President uh, Joe Biden to come up and say, we need to, to uh, lead the world by example. So this idea of, uh, continuation of uh, America supporting for the freedom around the world and also the liberty for those countries that their uh, human rights were violated. So America has obligation to, to uh, uh, bring these people into the uh, uh, more freedom, uh, kind of uh, political freedom in their own countries. This was has been advocated by President um, uh, Biden when he also uh, and his administration is trying to highlight the issues in, uh, in the Hong Kong and also the Uyghur population in Xinjiang in China and elsewhere as well. So this idea of 1940s and 1950s, uh, two Eurasian, uh, Eurasian countries, which is uh, Russia and China, uh, are pretty much against the values of the United States. Even though at that time, President Truman never used the word uh, communism in his speech. He never used the word communism, but he is taking about uh, oppression to their own people. But he was very careful not to say that one. So therefore also when President uh, uh, Biden 
who is talking about uh, supporting the Ukrainian uh, uh, government and uh, their armed forces through not direct engagement, but indirectly through NATO forces and supporting the uh, 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 Ukrainian military. He was very careful not to antagonize the Russian leader Vladimir Putin. When uh, 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 President Volodymyr uh, Zelensky of Ukraine asked for the no-fly zone when the Russian bombs uh, were bombardment in uh, eastern Donbas province and then near uh, Crimea and uh, into the north and to forces coming toward the invading force in coming toward the Kiev. So he, US did not want to, in collaboration with the NATO, uh, want, don't want to have a no-fly zone. And also at the same time, United States government and the European leaders are fully aware of the, the agreement that signed by the Russians and the, um, the Chinese leaders just at the uh, 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 Winter Olympic, opening of the Winter Olympic. In that agreement, China is pretty much is the one who uh, drafted this uh, more than 5,000 words documents. In that documents, it never mentioned about uh, Ukraine or invasion of Ukraine, nothing about it. But it does talk about uh, 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 Russian support for the Taiwan. So you can see there is a kind of strategy going on. They wanted to create it, uh, uh, their form of a democracy. Democracy mean centralism, democratic centralism. So now US view this one as a challenge. And at the same time, the challenge is this the two Eurasian giants coming together and they are as opposing these issues of uh, uh, freedom in their own countries and, uh, you know, censorship of their media and uh, uh, putting people in opposition leaders are in jail and then extending their also the tenure as president and changing the constitution to their own personal uh, uh, pres uh, political preservation and so forth. So that created a problem for the US and then uh, this is undermining uh, pretty much of the Truman Doctrine. So there, when President Joe Biden came into power and he released the, his uh, national security strategy. In his national security strategy, it says we need to, to re-engage with the American democratic allies around the world, like Australia and Japan, South Korea, and India, for example, and also the strengthening the American Security Foundation in Europe, which means strengthening the NATO force, NATO alliances. So that, at the same document in the National Security docu Strategy document in this interim report, it says identified China as the uh, strategic competitor to the U.S. So this is a pretty much focus on China, identifying China as a strategic competitor. So when that happened, uh, uh, US government, when he came into power, first one of the first things he did, it was he wanted to have a summit for democracy. These are the one of the campaign promises that he wanted to bring back the region is the rejuvenate the idea of uh, democracy, not only the US, but around the world, because during the Trump administration, uh, it turned a different direction. So therefore, he had this uh, summit for democracy, and then also wanted to upgrade the NATO alliances and its relationship with the Atlantic partners, and also promoting the Indo-Pacific Quad between, uh, uh, among India, Japan and Australia. Uh, and then uh, interesting part came, it was a kind of surprise to the diplomatic community around the world, which uh, was the AUKUS uh, agreement, where that uh, United States uh, signed this uh, nuclear submarine agreement with Australia, United Kingdom and the United States. As that also had uh, issues with uh, 
uh, the, the uh, France, because France is still wanted to have this agreement with the uh, Australian, but it was kind of bypassed and went with this uh, Anglo-Saxon community of Australian and uh, UK and the US. So this action was uh, threatening to the Chinese uh, leadership because now you can see this is the different formation of a different incarnation of the Truman doctrine is coming to the forefront of the American foreign policy. And then uh, this whole thing, the Ukraine war, the, um, uh, uh, and the, uh, the premise of that war was also, I think, is hidden in this uh, uh, Chinese and Russian agreement, which they talk about, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, never talk about uh, uh, Ukraine, but they are underlining uh, uh, issue is to, you can create uh, America's focus going on to the Ukraine in the Eastern flag of the NATO forces, NATO command. And then uh, once there's the diver diversion coming into that region, then China thought America and the West boggled down with the Ukraine. China can also achieve their own national interest. The, unification of uh, Taiwan into the mainland China, People's Republic of uh, uh, China. So that is strategy pretty much uh, on hold right now, uh, if I may say so. But there is a one thing happen. The thing is that, that the 30 years of Colo uh, Cold War uh, between the East and the West uh, is pretty much over. Uh, which started with the collapse of the Soviet Union and it's uh, uh, after Gorbachev's, uh, Mike, Mikhail Gorbachev's time. So end of colonial, I mean, end of Soviet Union is also agonizing uh, and painful experience for President Putin. So he wanted to have uh, one thing which also coincide with the the national goal, national objective of China. China is China wants to rejuvenate the, their own Chinese culture. They wanted to have all glory, which they had it prior to the uh, the uh, hundred years of uh, humiliation by the West or the colonial powers, and they wanted to bring back this uh, 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 middle kingdom back into the forefront of uh, international affairs uh, in a, as a global, global, power, uh, global uh, uh, power. At the same time, President uh, Putin wants to have a imperial Russia, which is going before the uh, 1917 October Revolution by the Bolshevik. So he wants to, to bring this is the old glory that they, they lost uh, during the collapse of the Soviet Union. And also the President Xi Jinping wants to, to have the rejuvenation of the Chinese culture. So these two things happen. One is the humiliated uh, empire wanted to be the middle kingdom and rejuvenate their own culture. They have a strategy, long-term strategy. And the, also the wounded empire, which is Russia, after the collapse of Soviet Union, wanted to bring back the all imperial glory to its uh, uh, forefront uh, of world affairs. So these two are happening now because 75 years ago, when you said uh, at the very beginning, the Truman Doctrine was introduced. That was the end of the one era of the First World War, uh, come and went, and the Second World came and uh, with the tragically end. And there are victors of the uh, 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 World War II, who later happened to be the five veto members of the UN Security Council. So at that time, John Kennan, our acting ambassador in uh, Moscow, he wrote this is a very important document called Long Telegram which later became famous as the X article in foreign affairs. He recognized after World War II, Lyonev Brezhnev 
uh, uh, Stalin uh, wants to, to create uh, 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 expand of the communism uh, and their influence around right. the world. So there are two things happen. One is in John Kennan's article, he talks about uh, that uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union that time wanted to send uh, uh, support the communist forces in Greece. At the same time, Soviet Union wants to, to have uh, joined Turkey in order to secure their oil uh, transport uh, into Crimea and to the Soviet uh, Union through the Black Sea. It has to go through the Turkey. So he wants to, to have uh, this uh, joint agreement with the Turkey and Russia also wanted to support these uh, communist forces in, uh, uh, um, in Greece. So these two events led uh, John Kennan to write this article. There is the uh, Iron Curtain is coming down. Then he said, uh, there is a global, global struggle between the democracy and the communism. And the US need to stop that one. But at that time, United Kingdom under Winston Churchill was much weaker. So they cannot support uh, Greece or the Turkey. And they asked the US. And for example, that uh, 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 Prime Minister Churchill went to the US and he made that uh, famous uh, 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 speech in Missouri, Fulton, Missouri. And he talks about the Iron Curtain coming down. So U.S. need to do something about it. And then uh, Harry S. Truman is the one who was with uh, uh, Prime Minister Churchill in uh, Missouri. Uh, and uh, he supported this idea. And also the impetus coming from the John Kennan article, which he said, America must support uh, pretty much uh, Greece and Turkey. And then also, then uh, Harry S. Truman found the NATO, and then he also did the Berlin airlift, uh, and then also he implemented the Marshall Plan, reconstruction of the uh, Germany and also Japan. And then also created the, this uh, Britain Wood uh, Agreement, uh, uh, creating the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, which later called uh, World Bank, and uh, for long-term reconstruction effort. This is parallel with the uh, Marshall Plan. And then we have the short-term import-export uh, financial issues. Uh, International Monetary Fund created uh, to support these countries to deal with their foreign exchange. And also there is a third organization they called, uh, they created the World Trade Organization. So now the vote on post war world has a new infrastructure, which is standing on a tripod of the World Bank, IMF, World Trade Organization. The first two was very important at the very beginning of the reconstruction and the, during the Cold War period. And later on, uh, when during President uh, uh, Clinton time, uh, World uh, Trade Organization become more uh, important because he thought he wanted to integrate the world coming together and invited China to, to be the membership by the encouragement of the Clinton administration. So now America thought, now we won. Just like Francis Fukuyama said, uh, the, the end of history, now is the new beginning of the democracy. It did not happen that way. So now we can see the rise of China and also the invading forces in Ukraine take a pretty much the U-turn. So now the question is the world community and the smaller countries and islands like Sri Lanka has pretty much uh, uh, depend on the new global structure created by the uh, Britain Wood Institution. Now it is going to change uh, after this uh, uh, new agreement uh, uh, between China and Russia, which they said, there is no limit to their friendship. 
So that means that they are beyond the economic and diplomatic uh, concern, but also they are supporting the oil and gas, uh, which is pretty much very important to also to the Europe, like uh, Germany and uh, France, which is also why there is a, a slowness of to responding to the Russian um, aggression in the Ukraine. And also the China wants to, to have uh, this is uh, uh, sources of energy comes from the Russia in case if there is a blockade in Malacca Strait uh, near the Singapore, and if the US or the West were to block that one, China has the way to get the energy forces to China uh, uh, to uh, keep their economy going. But they have other alternatives as well. You have, uh, this is the Pakistan Chinese corridor that going through the Karachi to the Western part of China to, uh, to Xinjiang and the oil pipe gas line. And the other one is to the Myanmar that's going through the all the way to uh, the China. Uh, uh, in case there is a blockade in the Malacca Strait and or the, is there is a conflict in the South China Sea. So what you see is that China is strategically try to avoid and thinking ahead strategically in case there is a conflict for to achieve in their uh, national goal, which is the unification of uh, uh, Taiwan, China has uh, another alternative way of getting their economy going. So this way, China was very strategic in that sense. At the same time, then uh, President Joe Biden said, uh, we need to, to have this is the triumph of democracy and liberalism in the world, the continuation of the Britain Wood uh, architecture, because uh, many countries benefited, including China benefited from the Bretton Wood architecture and getting into the World Trade Organization and to become a pre, uh, in term of the trade, they have a liberal trade policies and but economically they have uh, autocratic uh, uh, political uh, inspiration for China, which goes with the Confucian culture that is understandable you know, with the, this uh, Chinese governance, which they call the central um, uh, democratic centralism with the Chinese characteristic. So therefore, Biden wants to, to support the democracy around the world as opposed to autocracies that develop in many parts of the world. So therefore, Biden administration, Biden White House is uh, pretty much confronting the and highlight in the human rights violation in the Xinjiang and uh, bringing uh, criticism about uh, Chinese engagement in Hong Kong and also the support in Taiwan and uh, also the Ukraine uh, human rights uh, uh, and the democratic values uh, and also the uh, enforcing this uh, unprecedented economic sanction that we have ever seen in human history or uh, that uh, United uh, State led the Western alliances against the stop in this uh, economic and financial transaction against the uh, Russian institution, especially the Russian Central Bank. So what you see is the this is the reformulation and the reincarnation of the Truman Doctrine that is uh, pretty much uh, in coming into the forefront of the world affairs. So in essence, now what we say is the question is the world community. Do we want to, to live in uh, personal freedom that you can express your ideas, you not get into jail or you disappear in the world? And your journalists and the newspaper people and anchors are disappeared because they criticize their own government. So you want to, to live in that kind of censorship, their personal freedom are limited and uh, pretty much uh, remove and a small group of people like uh, in Russia, we call oligarch and even other countries, there are a small group of people controlling their regime for personal interest. They don't have a national strategies. They only think they are thinking about their own personal enrichment and the political power uh, and their own, their own pres uh, family preservation. So this kind of world, are we wanted to live in that kind of world at the expense of ordinary people? You do not 
give the rights for those people. And then they are pretty much, some countries are pretty much selling off their countries to other countries and they are very wealthy and they have uh, secret bank accounts uh, just like oligarch had and even not uh, Russia, but other countries as well. You probably know there are certain regimes, uh, there are countries, leaders are not their own nationals, uh, but they kind of uh, falsifies their uh, and also misinformation driven a uh, very savvy uh, media campaign uh, got elected into certain position, but their interests are not a national interest. Now you can see the economic turmoil in certain countries. And uh, you, uh, do you want to live in uh, that kind of country? Or do you want to have uh, people have the rights to change their leaders in a uh, fixed election? Do you want to have uh, leaders decide their destiny, not the few parliamentarian change in their constitution. So this is the kind of world that America wants to have. What you see seen is when President Xi Jinping extended his life uh, presidency and also President Putin, and they are changed their constitution. And other countries emulate in this one, this is auto autocratic autocracy in their own regime because they have a model. So do you want to have uh, that kind of model where your personal freedom is uh, uh, violated and people are in prisons and their censorship is coming on and some are not necessarily censorship, they have a self-censorship. Why? Because they are afraid to talk. Even some religious leaders and even the academic community, they don't want to talk about it because they are at danger because their own personal interests are at danger because these regimes are so powerful and they have a corrupt group of people in Russia they call oligarch and they are pretty much controlling the regime at the expense of Russian people and other countries as well. So question now for us is the Harry S. Truman doctrine is that this revival of this doctrine is to give the freedom to the people who wants to live in with their uh, freedoms, they have a right to religious worship and to express their ideas and assembly and also to their freedom to change their governments and their leaders in more peaceful way. So this is the what I think is the President Joe Biden uh, uh, and American determination to promote the democracy around the world uh, in uh, as opposed to this uh, autocracy's uh, forces are at work uh, because of this, the two Eurasian giants, China and Russia is uh, trying to attack the Western values and the universal values of the West. So this is essentially not cells of the President Joe Biden, uh, uh, a new Truman doctrine. I hope I kind of covered uh, pretty much essential part of uh, um, uh, 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 what kind of world that we are evolving into. So choice is for the majority of the people, just like uh, President Harry S. Truman said, the people, majority of the people, are we going to stay with the majority of people or few very corrupt politicians and powerful people who are supporting, not for the national interest, not for the national development, but for their own personal enrichment. So that's the kind of world we want to live in. So the, the people, the majority has to decide where we want to go as uh, people of the world or people of their countries as free people. Thank you very Thank much, you. George. I hope that uh, uh, um, answer your very broad uh, question about uh, 75 years later, uh, what do you think about the Harry, uh, Truman's doctrine? I hope this is very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, because you really uh, fleshed out so much that has been taking place over the 75 year period when you reflected upon what happened, how momentous that decision was taken 75 years ago, and how we see relevance of it today. If I were to just ask you, uh, we obviously understand that the Truman doctrine really altered America's position in the world. Uh, in retrospect, would we argue, would we say that this was for the better? 
America has sometimes gone into conflicts, they've withdrawn, they've taken a step back. Uh, when we reflect upon the doctrine, would America have been better off without this doctrine? Why else might, some might argue that? Would it have been better to remain isolationist? Uh, excellent question, excellent question. This also goes back to uh, the uh, 1776, when America was founded by the uh, enlightened founding fathers, uh, who wants to do this country to be global nation? And uh, anybody from anywhere can come and this is a kind of promised land for them. It is the global nation is the first time that, that we created a nation other countries and civilization evolved. This new nation wanted to have a freedom. That is why we got rid of the, our mother country of the United Kingdom because of the colonial past. America was a colony, just like Sri Lanka was or India was. And uh, America fought this revolutionary war and got rid of the British, the red coats. And then uh, they said, uh, we need to have a freedom we don't want to have uh, this is colonial powers. Then later on, that uh, do, uh, um, develop another kind of doctrine, which is pretty much like the, uh, the, the Truman Doctrine, which is we call the Monroe Doctrine. That means the colonial powers of the West should not come into the Western Hemisphere, which means to North America or the South America. Whenever it come, we consider it's the act of war. Uh, and uh, President uh, Monroe, James Monroe uh, formulated that uh, uh, doctrine. So what you can see is that at the very beginning of the country, America wants to be a global nation. And not only that, and there's a very important things happen during that formative years of the United States as an infant nation, infant country. So when we kicked out the British and the colonial powers, America sent our first commercial ships to China from uh, on George Washington's birthday in uh, uh, 1794, I think. It's called the Empress of China. It sent on George Washington's birthday uh, from the New York Harbor to Canton. It's modern day of Guangzhou near, near Hong Kong. So it sent the message that America's mission in the world is a commercial mission. And it was elaborated by President George Washington. He said, uh, entangle with none. And also our first Secretary of State, uh, George uh, Thomas Jefferson said, entangle with none and friendship with the all. So pretty much uh, we use the trade as a vehicle to have uh, this uh, commercial relationship. Or oh, then uh, even in the US constitution, it says, uh, most important doc, uh, clause in the US Constitution is the Commerce, Co uh, Commerce Clause. Commerce Clause talk about, even though this is the two words, uh, it has uh, three different concepts, uh, which is uh, say, we need to trade with the uh, Native American, uh, which is the, these 13 colonies at that time. And uh, uh, we need to trade uh, with the uh, world. And uh, also the, uh, we need to, to be a global nation. So it was talking about uh, this is a trade with the Native American and the, around these 13 states and the uh, rest of the world. These three points was integrated in the, the constitution. So therefore America wants to, to have a global engagement at the very beginning of the country. So in order to have a global engagement, countries have to be free. They have a freedom to trade freedom to have a commercial intercourse with other countries. So in order to create that kind of world, we need to have uh, these democratic ideas and freedom. So that is why America wants to, to have and always been to be a global nation. Of course, America has its own uh, struggle. Uh, uh, this is uh, going to the civil war and to the civil rights movement in the Martin Luther King's time, even, even today. America has its own struggle. That is why we call it uh, America is an experiment. So this is American experiment. We have a way to cause correction. If we have a problems every four years, people have a, a freedom to elect a new people. This kind of mechanism 
provide the continuity of the aspiration of the majority of people at the while we are respecting the minority rights and the majority rules. So that experiment work throughout the American history and the history of other countries uh, since the, uh, America was born or uh, created. So this kind of uh, world, not always the perfect, you know, I mean, Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of <laughs> governance, uh, you know, but it is the best form uh, given the, all the alternatives. So at least the United States has this is a course correction mechanism. If you do something wrong, we can go back and correct it in four years. We don't need to wait, uh, wait a lifetime, just like uh, uh, Stalin did, or now uh, Putin wants to do it, and or President Xi Jinping wants to do it, because these are not the will of the people. They don't have a corrective mechanism. So the, the, even um, uh, some other countries, they wanted to have a change the constitution and then they can uh, elect the uh, even a non-national into their government uh, and to give in a very important portfolios uh, to for their own personal enrichment. You can see, uh, you don't need to go far away. You can see inside in the nearby Indian Ocean uh, rim countries, uh, you see this kind of things are happening. So therefore to answer your question, George is uh, uh, American, wanted to have this tendency to be isolationist. You can see that one in the President Donald Trump's time. Now is the recorrection, recourse took place with the President Joe Biden and America is into now the founding vision. That's the founding mission is he's carrying on what America meant to Americans and America meant to the world. So therefore, in my view, America is in the uh, course correction and the right path uh, to achieve America's uh, vision for the world as uh, founding fathers envisioned. Professor, if I were to just ask you, when you look at US foreign policy having been within the mechanism, within the system, and if you reflect upon the last seven and a half decades, would you say that there has been a great degree of consistency or radical change over time? Uh, well, there are uh, not radical change but uh, their tactical operations was misfired. For example, uh, looks about, uh, look at uh, America's engagement in foreign wars, uh, going to uh, Panama or even to the Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq. Let's take uh, the key points in American history in the recent past uh, 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 Vietnam war. Vietnam War is also the reflection of this expansion of the communism that uh, the North Vietnamese were supported by the Chinese government, the uh, Chairman Mao Zedong, and also the uh, Russian leaders uh, 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 that time, uh, uh, Stalin. So America has the engaged I mean, a mission to stop that kind of uh, communism is spreading into the Asia. So that was the engagement in the Vietnam, which, uh, which was a failure. Uh, and then uh, we learned that lessons. And then came in the North Korean war. Now we have a South uh, Korean war. We have uh, this Pen Korean peninsula is divided by 37 um, degree. Uh, line between the north and south. Now we're still continuing. This was not the war was not ended yet officially at least. So now then America under President uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, to the pretext of uh, this uh, terrorism that the 9/11 event that uh, we went to kind of democracy promotion uh, uh, in the Middle East and it turned into a fiasco itself. And uh, then uh, Iraq war and Afghanistan. There's a legitimate reason for going to the Afghanistan. That's where the Al-Qaeda was hiding. But going to Iraq was the war of choice, which I think it was a mistake. And there are also, we can analyze uh, what was the causation, motivation for the US to do that one. These are the kind of things there are is still consistent with this the ideology of the Americanism, which is to make America uh, 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 safe 
uh, or the world safe for freedom, uh, democracy, which was again going back to the uh, President Woodrow Wilson after World War I, he said in the Versailles summit, the America's mission is to make world safe for democracy. So in that context, when you after the World War II, after uh, seven and a half, uh, seven decades and a half later, uh, we are pretty much continuing this American vision in a different form. When Harry S. Truman talked about that one, you know, to safeguard the freedom of a majority of people, or if you go back to the after World War I, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson talking about uh, the uh, make world safe for democracy and uh, uh, creation of the League of Nations, which failed, and then uh, uh, World War II happened, <laughs> then we created the United Nations. Until that time, the, that's the architecture that created by the President uh, uh, Truman, uh, creation of the UN system, Britain was the institution, and creation of the NATO, and the integration of a minority in the American forces, and creation of the US Air Force. All this happened during the uh, uh, this uh, uh, Truman administration. It is pretty much the Truman doctrine is unfolding. So therefore, I would say uh, different tactics we use, but the mission and the vision of uh, America is still remain the same. Professor, if I were to just draw your attention to this term interventionist, this term was truly defined by uh, the United States. And after the Cold War, America became the only superpower on the world stage. Do you feel that this has changed or does the country still command its position of power? You know, this is the perception issue also. Uh, uh, and you can see this is the soft power instruments are being used, both the US and China and Russia, the misinformation and disinformation and the creating the image, they are very, superpower. Look at uh, uh, Russia. This is the, one of the world's most formidable military force. What happened? They couldn't even move their military tanks. Uh, they wanted to have a take over uh, Ukraine within three days, 72 hours. Now is more than a month. This is the most powerful superpower. And now they are pretty much into drag into what the Soviet Union did in Afghanistan. And during the Afghanistan debacle, Soviet Union in that long duration, in terms of the Ukraine, Ukraine has killed more Russian soldiers than the decades long of Soviet occupation in Afghanistan. And during this one month, the great superpower lost more people than their decades all the Soviet intervention. Can you imagine this is the, their perception of this superpower is gone. At the same time, China is also promoting their uh, military capabilities and they are uh, demonstrating their uh, technological advancement, uh, which is rightly so, okay? At the war is going on in the Eastern uh, plaque of NATO right now, China is also showing their military might and technological advancement and uh, sending uh, uh, aircraft and satellite to the space uh, and to the uh, exp uh, space explorations and a military engagement and building of new aircraft carriers, third one after the first one in Leonin uh, and the second one Shandong. So they are creating this perception to the world. Now we are the emerging power. What we do not know, just like we have experienced in the what happened to Russian debacle in so far in Ukraine. This is the power is the perception issue. Uh, and uh, we can see same thing about uh, Americans. Uh, uh, the almighty went into the 10 year war in Iraq and uh, Iran, may, uh, may, sorry, uh, in Afghanistan. And we have to pull out, you know, uh, as uh, remarkable 
humiliation for the American military. You know, we accept that one. So that is the learning process that we need to, to be, we need to remember if now China is trying to portray they are the superpower, they have the military know-how, they have advanced Navy, advanced Air Force, uh, and their technological know-how is going to space and cybersecurity. All these element is their soft power to create a world that in their own image. But we do not know the weaknesses of the Russian, Chinese system itself and the uh, repression of their own people and censorship. And this can, uh, can change. So this is why that it is important for us to realize uh, the perception of power is, is the kind of propaganda machine, is, uh, is what the countries do. Okay, look at it, the small countries. And they think, oh yes, we don't have a foreign currency exchange problems. We are fine. We have a, a organic fertilizer. We can do it all, everything in uh, domestically, for example, in Sri Lanka. And we don't need uh, uh, West. We can go to China to get the foreign currency, which they did. And they can do into the India, they get a line of credit uh, to, for short term. And finally, we don't want West. In fact, these leaders never understood was Sri Lankan economy is largely based on uh, trade with the West and textile export and so forth. We don't export tea to China. China doesn't need tea. We don't need to export uh, tea or rubber or coconut to India. No, our trade is there, but the leaders create this perception we are organic, self-sufficient, we can do it ourselves. But the saddest commentary was, even Sri Lanka went to Bangladesh to ask for money. Even they said, we don't want to go to the IMF. Now they are going to even to Bangladesh. Can you believe that one? The pride is the reality is now hitting to the, the perception that they are creating. They have the brain power and the economic power and the political power inside the country. They create the certain kind of perception. That's what all countries do. I'm not blaming about one country or the other. That's what everybody does. This is a natural tendency uh, of the countries. So now the reality we need to, to ask is, this given the experience of Soviet uh, Russia in Ukraine, or the American debacle in Afghanistan. Is this the perception of their power? Is this a true power? So that is the question one needs to, to ask. And somebody has to tell these leaders, look, this is not the reality. The reality is something else. Because uh, we often hesitate to learn from the history, even though it repeats itself in a different format, different incarnation, we tend to refuse to um, accept that reality because uh, our ego is larger than the reality. Uh, so that is the, uh, the perception problem. I think we need to be careful about whether it is the superpower or, or the economic power or the political power, even in small countries, there are certain regime thinking they are the greatest for that country ever had, and there is no other leaders replace them. Of course, world continues. You know, there are great people in the graveyards, but it's still world continues, am I right? Absolutely, this is where, if you don't learn from history, history repeats itself. And we also sometimes take it to understand that people are indispensable and they've got to be there for a long time. When you look at yes. all American presidents, Professor, from uh, Truman onwards, uh, who would you say was most passionate about this doctrine, um, probably other than Truman himself? You know, except uh, President Donald Trump, uh, who advocate uh, and have friendship with the oldest, even uh, after his post presidency, he, he, he uh, uh, admired President, Pro, uh, President Putin and, and other dictators. And other than him, 
all American presidents are Americans. They uh, speak like American, talk like American, act like American. And all the president, Harry S. Truman onward, whether it is a Republican and Democrats, they act like Americans, except uh, I think President, uh, President uh, Trump, uh, because their motivation is coming from impetus, is coming from the very minority group of extremists, uh, which I call the uh, extremist form of uh, tele-evangelist who are behind his base and uh, some uh, extremist nationalist, nationalist groups, which we can see everywhere, anywhere, any, every country in the world. There are some extremist groups. Now they had the president who are pretty much uh, uh, epitomize that kind of worldview. When you think about uh, if they really do understand the American history itself, what America stands for, what America, why they went to wars in around the world. So other than President Trump, I think other Americans, including President Ronald Reagan, uh, that was my first uh, president when I was in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was the US president, Ronald Reagan in mid 1980s. I have a great admiration for him. Uh, because he talked like an American, and he was an American. And I think many American leaders are American. And uh, that is uh, what we think is the, our system, recorrections comes in to create uh, what America is meant to be and uh, 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 following its uh, founding mission and the vision for the world. Professor, do you see a parallel between the Reagan doctrine and the Truman doctrine? Uh, pretty much, it is a continuation. Remember that uh, when President uh, Ronald Reagan said uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Gorbachev turned down this wall, the Berlin Wall. Pretty much that what happened when uh, under Gorbachev's time, when Yeltsin came into power and we thought uh, China, Russia is... Uh, uh, Russian Federation was going to go in a different direction. Okay, and uh, they are pretty much, you can see the resemblance of the Truman Doctrine that uh, tear down this wall on the Berlin and bring the East Germany and West Germany together. Now we have a very prosperous Germany. And then people thought at that time when the Berlin Wall came down, Next, go to the North Korea. North Korea and South Korea is going to united. And uh, because of the political structure in the East Asia uh, and the Northeast uh, region of Asia uh, are different because there are different circumstances, different histories with China, Russia, and Korea, and also Japan. So uh, that didn't happen and it still uh, is an issue. But we thought uh, America is going to have this uh, democratic world and people live in freedom. So I think uh, in that respect that uh, Reagan doctrine uh, to promote uh, democracy in the world is uh, also the continuation of the uh, Truman doctrine. Professor, finally, I'm very conscious of the time and the time that we are taking from you. America has openly expressed support for Ukraine. You've shared this with us, we've discussed this already. Are you concerned that we're on the brink of the Third World War? That's an excellent question. Nobody knows. You know, first time, uh, the Second World War happened that uh, Nazis, uh, Hitler forces, first came to Poland. Poland was the one they invaded first. If you look at it, uh, importance of Poland, that's where I'm speaking from the uh, uh, Warsaw University. This is Poland on this side. This is a uh, European Union on the, this side um, uh, flag, uh, which uh, resembled uh, uh, that uh, importance of Poland. During the World War I, Poland is very critical. And prior to that one, Poland was not a country. It was completely disappeared more than 100 years. 
and uh, there was no country called Poland. It was uh, ruled by, divided by the three powers. One is the Russian Empire and Porosian Empire and Austrian Hungarian Empire. There was no Poland. So that was created much later. And then the World War I came on, and then uh, World War II came in, and World War II also was kind of divided by the German, the Nazi uh, Hitler's forces, and also the Russian forces came from the East uh, to take over Poland. So new boundaries are changed. So now World War I, we went to World War I through Poland. World War II, we went through the Poland. And uh, if you want to talk about World War III, it has to go through Poland because this is the NATO's last frontier, Eastern flag that border in uh, uh, Ukraine. So that is why you can see, realize this is, uh, policymakers in Washington or Brussels or even Warsaw government, they all realized the importance of Poland. Poland is the way to either to the next World War III or to create a new world order. So that is what we do not know whether how this is, uh, uh, this Russian invasion is going to end, uh, but uh, Russia is activating, trying to divide the Europe between the uh, Germany and uh, France uh, and the United Kingdom and the US and they do to all these strategies to, to uh, Russia to prevail. And also Poland has to be reminded itself because Poland didn't have a so-called country that emerged in the World War I and II and World War III will might decide whether Poland is the next after Ukraine or Baltic countries, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, these three former Soviet republics are the next so what we can see is uh, 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 the, how united the Western democracies or the NATO is also the determining factor whether we are going to, to have uh, World War III. That is why I think uh, NATO forces, NATO uh, leaders, and also the US led by President Biden do, uh, did, uh, did not want to have uh, no fly zone. Even though Vladimir Zelensky asked for uh, no fly zone, and then he specifically asked for also the patriotic anti missile defense mechanism, the, the umbrella mechanism for patriotic missiles, uh, that um, which uh, America also shared with South Korea, for example, and also with Israel. So uh, we do not want to, for the American side, uh, do not want to escalate it into a no-fly zone or the patriotic missile system employed uh, for, that was a direct attack on, uh, on uh, Russia and Russian warplanes. If you want to have a no-fly zone in the uh, uh, NATO uh, forces have to enforce that one. That's a direct engagement. So I can see, the same as that uh, Harry S. Truman, President Truman um, uh, were, was very careful not to use the word communism at that time and uh, avoid this uh, direct engagement with the Soviet Union under Stalin. Uh, and uh, we had the supported uh, uh, Greece and supported uh, Turkey and is still continuing. Is still continuing. We provide the military aid to those two countries, to NATO forces. They are NATO countries, both Greece and uh, Turkey. So what we can see is the Third World War that you are asking. I think uh, policymakers and the military planners are acutely aware of uh, what happened on the World War One, World War Two, and that is why President Joe Biden came this weekend, past weekend, to Warsaw and give that uh, eloquent and I think excellent, very powerful speech, uh, why we need to support Ukraine and defend uh, uh, Poland, unless we have uh, that kind of direct, uh, what he called the 
uh, uh, very secret, sacred uh, commitment that US has for the NATO in order to protect uh, Poland, because we know Poland was a critical uh, country in this uh, uh, in this uh, fight against uh, uh, aut uh, uh, autocracy versus uh, democracy. So I think uh, given the history of uh, where Poland play a critical role in the World War One and World War Two, and if there is a World War Three, Poland is going to be the centerpiece of that uh, uh, conflict. So I think we all realize it, that one, that is why President Biden came after his trilogy meeting uh, between with the NATO forces and G7 meeting leaders and uh, also the uh, EU leaders in Brussels. And then his direct was uh, to Warsaw. And then he visited uh, NATO bases uh, in uh, southeast of Warsaw, very close to the Ukrainian border. And uh, you can signify it is also sending a hidden message to the world who are very much aware of the World War history and World, uh, World War one history and World War II history. So I think uh, President Biden is one of the most experienced uh, foreign policy president because he was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I remember uh, seeing him uh, in 1980s even when Senator Richard Luger was the chairman. And at uh, that time onward, and he has the, this accumulated uh, experience and wisdom and he is fully aware of the World War I and II and the importance of Poland to, to preserving the American ideas and American vision of democracy and freedom for the world. I can only hope, as you said, Professor, that we are not, we are not on the brink, we are not going over the edge. And one of the very wisest things that President Biden has done in the entirety of his presidency is not to allow the no-fly zone. He has not gone ahead and sanctioned that. That's a very, very wise move. He's thinking and actually he's contributing towards global thinking there. It's something that the world does not want to see. We are so technologically advanced with nuclear weapons. Push up a button. We will all go. It won't be a case of eliminating your enemy. It will be eliminating humanity as we know it. And these are decisions yes. that they are taking today, which will have a huge impact on the world, how we will progress. So. Absolutely. At the same time, you have to remember, Ukrainian military process cannot survive this long without the support of the American uh, military uh, support and also the intelligence support and the cybersecurity support uh, for the military uh, uh, to the uh, Ukrainian forces and also the support that coming from the Poland and look at the refugee issue that now the uh, Poland has a very close to over two, uh, two million refugees. Last night I was visiting with uh, Ukrainian students uh, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, uh, walking with them uh, and showing about the history of uh, Warsaw, uh, walking with on the main uh, corridor that President Joe Biden traveled uh, this weekend. So I can see this is a, a remarkable young people uh, are witnessing the, another transformation and the change in the world. I'm hoping uh, someday these refugees can return home. At the same time, US also accepted more than 100,000 refugees, uh, Ukrainian refugees, the US and other countries as well. And in that sense, you can understand the uh, Polish people remember their own history, the history of having not a country because they did have a, a Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth. It was one of the uh, leading uh, commonwealth at that time. And it was disappeared from the uh, world map. And now they had the country and the boundaries has changed. So now the Polish people realize this could happen to Ukraine. Ukraine was become a Soviet Republic uh, under the Bolshevik revolution. And, uh, and uh, uh, but a part of the, uh, uh, the Lithuanian uh, Polish Commonwealth, uh, Ukraine was part of uh, this greater uh, Commonwealth, including the Belarusia uh, in the north of uh, Poland. So you can see uh, history matters and uh, 
if you don't know the history, it's going to repeat itself. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Polish people uh, are, are genuinely uh, welcoming this uh, 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 Ukrainian people. Can you imagine two million people are in Ukraine right now? Even my colleagues um, in the next door, uh, professors are from Ukraine. Uh, they are accommodating uh, University of uh, Warsaw is accommodating uh, Ukrainian professors here and a student. I have several students in my class. Um, so you can see that history is making at this point. But the thing is, I am hoping that our leaders learn from the history and think about the will of the majority of people, not the personal interest or the personal uh, enrichment and the self-preservation of their own power. So we need to think about the will of the majority. That's what the democracy is all about. That's what America is all about. Professor, thank you so very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise. You've traveled around the world. You've written over 150 publications, books, co-authored articles, edited, uh, and it's been it's been an amazing conversation. We haven't even felt the time go by where you really gave us a very good overview. Uh, when we stand here in 2020 and 2022 and look back at the 75th anniversary of the Truman Doctrine, what it meant to America at that time, what it meant to the world, what it meant to international relations as a subject in its entirety. We've been talking about President Biden's new Truman Doctrine in Ukraine. What's past is prologue. We're indeed honored to have been able to engage with Professor Patrick Mendes here at the Avalog Initiative and talk to him on this milestone, on this anniversary, through the Avalog Lecture Forum. Thank you once again for joining us. Please join us again next time when the Avalog Initiative continues to focus on key anniversaries, key moments, developments in the world. We try to create that much more awareness and generate dialogue in the field of international relations. Hi, Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you once again.